So, the fate of a body uh, in the Saanich Inlet. Death on the high seas. Uh, many deaths and many body dumpings occur in the ocean. Uh, and when a killer dumps a body, uh, they think it's going to go away. Well, it does for a while. And then it comes back. And the problem with this sort of situation is that the investigation of the death is extremely difficult. The medical parameters that we would normally use on land are pretty useless. Uh, mostly, uh, any kind of discussion about the length of time the body's been in the water is pretty much subjective. It's based on the experience of the investigators, <coughs> excuse me, and the pathologists. There's very little, or there was, very little uh, empirical data available on this sort of thing. Time of death was based usually on when the person was last seen alive. And that's just fine, it was Uncle Teddy who'd gone out for his, his normal little boat trip and was expected back on Tuesday evening, um, and Uncle Teddy never came home. Well, probably it was Tuesday evening. But when it's a homicide, killers are inclined to lie. So, being able to interpret the, the taphonomy of the body is extremely important from an investigative point of view. Taphonomy is everything from the moment the body um, dies to the moment the body is discovered. And until we did this work, there were very few studies that had been done, and most of those were very much anecdotal looking at case histories. Now, to most of us, that's a picture postcard view of a uh, very pretty city, lovely ocean, lovely city, uh, pretty view. Uh, to a killer, of course, that's a steaming metropolis of crime and a lovely great dumping ground. Now, medical, legal, or forensic entomology, which is what I really am, I'm a forensic entomologist, <coughs> excuse me, it looks at the insects or the arthropods associated with a dead body, and we use them in a crim criminal investigation in order to estimate primarily elapsed time since death, but also a lot of other things about the death as well. This is very little understood in the marine environment. And of course, this has become a rather uh, big issue over the last, in fact, almost exact times we've been doing these studies uh, with the so-called mysteries of the, uh, the floating feet. So the Saanich studies uh, to date, they're done at all around about 100 meters. We've done many experiments in the fall. We did the very first experiment in August 2006, and then we repeated it in 2007 and repeated it again in 2008. The only way we could do replication in those days was, <coughs> excuse me, as we only had one camera, was to do that. And then again in 2012 in August, and finally some spring experiments in 2013 in late April. Now the first thing we need to do is find something that we can use as a model <coughs> for human decomposition. And unfortunately for pigs, that turns out to be pigs. Uh, I'd love to do humans, and in fact I've had an awful lot of people over the last 10 years offering themselves. They would like to be buried at sea very much and they want to be buried under a camera. Um, but so far we haven't been able to do that, maybe, maybe later. <laughs> but uh, so far we've used pigs. Pigs, unfortunately for pigs, are good mimics for humans. They are roughly the same size as the adult human torso. They have the same kind of um, skin as ours. They have very little hair. And their decomposition is very similar to ours because they have the same kind of gut fauna. They're omnivores, they eat from all the food groups. <laughs> so they um, are uh, a very similar decomposition. It's often been said forensic entomologists are biological control agents for pigs. So here we have some of the infamous photographs weighing the pigs. We put the carcasses uh, down at 100 meters, but we wait, weighted them because once they're down there, we can't do anything with them. Uh, so we need to weight them because if an animal drags them out of camera range, I've lost the whole experiment. So it's not that I'm expecting any kind of bloat. It's just that uh, the, cat, the pig can't move. So here we have the pig attached to a, a transponder, or a pig sponder, as it was called, and slowly lowered into the ocean, the infamous photograph. And there we have the pig, the first pig going into the water. Excuse me, now the carcass was positioned under the camera by Ropos, and from that point on, there's no further physical uh, contact that we have with it. We can't move it at all. The camera is remotely operated, and video and still images recorded. And this is the early days when we had the camera. We actually had to operate it ourselves. So I went on the camera two or three times a day, at 8 in the morning and at 1800 hours, and not every time, but sometimes at 2 in the morning as well. And chemical and physical properties were recorded. So here's pig one, day one, the very first pig, 10 years ago. Uh, unusual suspects coming in, the squat lobsters, Dungeness crab, and the three-spot shrimp coming in to feed. Day two, somebody's taken a, a chomp out of my pig. We unfortunately didn't see this happen, but bite mark analysis suggests it was the six gill shark. This changed everything. This made the entire uh, that bite site uh, the massive interest to all the animals that came in. They ignored the orifices and went for that area. Now here you can see our problem with the ropes. The way we put the ropes here, you can see 
Now we've got lost half the pig at this end, the ropes are now sliding off and coming away. So the pig is now getting dragged away from the original site. We can see some of the artifacts that are formed by some of the animals. God, it's playing. And you can see the, the uh, carcasses, the carcass can actually be picked up and thrown around pretty much by the crab activity. So many people said they'd never eat a crab again after they saw these. I said, you've got to be kidding. Those are good, expensive pigs. Beautiful diet. Day 11, day 12, day 13 is beginning to get dragged away. Day 15. Notice the front end is almost completely intact. It's all been at that bite area. At day 17, what do we have? Disarticulated foot. This is a very famous picture, it's been everywhere. And by day 23, the, the pig has been dragged away from camera range. So we repeated it again the, the next year, the, the exact same thing. Uh, same site, 94 meters. A month later in the year, uh, same size pig. Weighted differently though, Richard developed a, a new weighted system so that uh, if I lost half the pig, I would still keep half the pig at least. This time we didn't lower the pig, Ropos <coughs> took it down. You can see the pig submerging. Day zero, same sort of uh, uh, usual features. Dungeness crab, spot shrimp. No shark comes in, so the crabs just rip the gut open. Can you play that? Yeah, that's good, thanks. And they just rip it open and dig in. Now again we start to see some of the artifacts forming from some of the picking of the crabs. I'll explain later why that's important. They're going for the soft bit, so there's ripping, actually ripping the tongue out. Day eight. Day 10. And the squats aren't doing much damage here, they're just kind of picking at it. But they can do quite a bit of damage once the skin has been broken. Once they can get into that area, see the, the crab ripping out the anus. But you can see the squatty staying away mostly from the crabs and um, going for the, the bits that have already been torn open. And themselves, you can see that they're pretty ineffective at ripping at the skin. You can see that one trying to rip an eyeball out and it's, uh, it's not doing tremendously well at it. Day 13. Day 17, I finally see what I've been waiting to see all the, from the very, very beginning. What I'd heard from recovery divers were going to be very, very common were um, these amphipods or sea lice uh, all over the cut surface. And somebody's taken a chomp under my pig again. But luckily, because of Richard's clever design of the waiting, we have half the pig is still there. And now you can see that the, you see with the amphipods here, the skin is just collapsing over the carcass as if it's just a dirty old shirt. And the amphipods are cleaning out the inside of it, <coughs> removing all the soft tissue from inside the skin, eating the skin last. And then pulling that skin off, uh, the spot lobster is pulling it off just like it is an old shirt. Pulling it away, and perfectly clean underneath. And ironically enough, the last thing left are the pig's ears. And so then, slowly they start picking away, getting the cartilage until there's nothing left. Pig three, the repeat, the third repeat. There's day zero, squat lobsters in as usual. Day five, day 15, not a lot happening. A little bit of grazing you can see here, but pretty much nothing happening. Uh, sulfur back mat forming, the, uh, the sole slipping it off a few times, but other than that, just pretty getting solid. And then suddenly, uh, let me go back a sec there, day 92, I turn the camera on, I can barely see it for the fish, and it takes almost two weeks before the arthropods come back. 
and then they slowly eat the carcass. Now the big differences between those three, there's a lot of other things I'm measuring too, but the big difference obviously with Saanich is the oxygen levels, and you can see Fig one is blue, and you can see um, it's pretty low oxygen, you know, two is considered comfortable. So it's pretty low oxygen. When we put Pig one in, and it drops pretty, pretty rapidly, it's even lower oxygen when we put Pig two in, and it drops rapidly. But even so, in both of those cases, those larger arthropods came in, and they fed, the resource was good enough. So they were still attracted to that resource until it got really, really low, and then it was just too much for them. The only things left were the squat lobsters. But by pig three, the oxygen levels were just too low when the, the carcass was deposited that it drove away all the larger decapods. It, it just wasn't, even though the carcass is there, it's very retractive, it was too stressful for them. And so that oxygen remains low, and there's nothing there. A few squatties for a while, then almost nothing. Then when the oxygen comes back, we start to see the, the vertebrates and quite a, quite a few days later before we actually get the inverts back. So this is the only spring experiments we've done, and this is an entirely, we've leapt forward several years now in a new um, design. Here we're putting two carcasses down, one caged and one exposed, and here we have automatic video. So it records every 15 minutes all on its own, um, measuring oxygen and a whole bunch of other things, of course, and here you can see the carcasses going down, one caged, just caged to keep sharks out, not caged to keep um, any of the larger <coughs> arthropods out or anything. And here we see usual suspects, three-spot shrimp, Dungeness crabs. Still fairly slow, day five. The shrimp mostly avoided the crabs if they could. Crabs would eat them on occasions, but uh, they said he went for them a lot. Uh, but the shrimp would come in in large numbers when the crabs weren't there. Day 15. Day 27, before we got any uh, squat lobsters at all on the carcasses, which was very interesting. And you can see by this point the carcass is degrading, it's saponifying, and you've got a, a film uh, sulfur mat on it. Once in a while a Dungeness crab would come in and feed for a while, eating pretty degraded tissue by this point. And then suddenly we start to see squadrons and squadrons. I don't know what the collective noun is for a, a squat lobster, Jackson. <laughs> yes, but squadrons of them can start coming in. You could scan the camera and it was really quite eerie as they were all just coming in. And here we see uh, an unusual video here of a squat lobster actually uh, molting on the carcass. <laughs> and you can see lots of um, shared carapaces everywhere. This is the spring, so this would be. It would be later, end of May. End of May, so that's, yeah, that's same like time. Same thing that you're seeing. Yeah. A massive, massive amount of molting. It's quite fascinating. Uh, you can see a lot of the, the shed carapaces here, and there must have literally been pounds and pounds mm -hmm. of them. And they would preferentially feed on the carapaces than on the carcass itself which I thought was very interesting. Even the, the Dungeness crabs would feed on those shed carapaces um, and basically ate them all. And so here you can see many, many sheds. And the whole outside area is covered in sheds. And you're just going to get a flash of the other carcass, but you'll see in a sec, just thousands. Tons and tons of them. Carcass still remains for a long time, day 89. The body is saponifying or turning to soap, and we're getting adipocere tissue. Although the, the carcasses are still being fed on somewhat by, by the crabs in, on, on rare occasions. They're still eating some of the tissue. And it takes four to six months before we get skeletonization. Now, the interesting thing here is in spring, the oxygen, although not great from other areas perhaps, is consistently above two at times, and certainly mostly <coughs> reasonably decent for the Sandwich Inlet area. And yet that, those carcasses still decompose extremely slowly, and I'd be interested in anybody's theories on that, because it's not just oxygen, there's a lot more driving the decomposition in Sandwich, because in Strait of Georgia, um, a carcass can be skeletonized in three to four days. 
So uh, very, very different in this kind of an area. Uh, the body is slowly decomposing. So the forensic applications here, <coughs> elapsed time since submergence, we're never going to be able to do what we can with land when we can do maggot uh, development and get it to quite that kind of a level. But we can certainly give an idea of how long the body's been in the water. We can give indications of the conditions of the site that the body's been at. <laughs> so has it been a low oxygen area? Um, has it, what kind of substrate has the body been on? That sort of thing. What about the artifacts found on the body? Are those something coming from the fauna? Or are those because something that happened during the time of death? Is it something to do with the actual murder of the person? <laughs> also, it's important to be able to guide recovery expectations for family and for divers, and be able to extrapolate these to local cases. Uh, the artifacts in particular, the kind of marks that we're getting on the carcasses, uh, are very, very important to us. And if necessary, I could actually show a video of some of these artifacts actually being created in court if it was, if it was uh, of value. Um, when the larger arthropods are excluded, the squat lobsters just graze and do very little damage. <coughs> One of the reasons that it's important to understand these artifacts, uh, I give you Mr. Kennedy Brewer. Kennedy Brewer was uh, convicted of the rape and murder of his little stepdaughter based on bite marks uh, found on the child's body which uh, matched, according to the bite mark specialist and the forensic pathologist, uh, the front two top teeth. <coughs> just his front two top teeth, you understand. None of the other teeth. They didn't leave a mark. But just his front two top teeth managed to make a mark. And anybody who's ever watched CSI or has, has done grade two science knows you never, ever, ever put the, uh, the tool anywhere near the mark. In, in this case, they actually created some of these marks using that just to see if they could press it into her skin. Um, Mr. Brewer was convicted, sentenced to death. He spent 15 years in prison, seven of those on death row. In 2001, DNA showed that he was not the donor of the semen inside that little girl. And uh, Innocence Project will tell you that that's what exonerated him. No, it wasn't, because they had bite marks on that child. And so, he, okay, maybe he wasn't the donor, maybe he didn't rape her, or maybe he used a condom and he was with somebody else. But hey, he certainly was there, he was part of it, because he bit her all over. And one of my colleagues and friends, Dr. John Wallace, from Millersville University, Pennsylvania, was able to recreate um, the uh, actual death in his own lab in what he calls a living stream. And he was able to show that those bite marks, supposedly, uh, were caused by crayfish. And uh, Mr. Kennedy Brewer was finally exonerated. So it's really, really important that we are able to understand those kind of artifacts. Uh, it's very important in recovery expectations when we've got natural disasters, terrorism, um, any other kind of deaths where you've got a large number of people in the water. It's very important for the recovery divers to know whether they're going down and looking for a body or they're looking for a, a scapula or a little bit of a bone. Also very important to the family to know, are you going to get a body back? People expect to get a body back coming out in a body bag. And in many cases, that's not going to be the case. I can show them what it would be like in the waters like Saanich Inlet compared with the very, very different situations that we've been seeing in the Strait of Georgia. This is the Strait of Georgia after 25 hours, and within three days, completely skeletonized. So a very, very dramatic, dramatically different picture in a different environment. And of course, this has been very much in the news in the last few years with the floating feet in Vancouver. The most recent one was found on Sunday, and I did, I have done four interviews today since I arrived here at 11.30. Um, <laughs> one live on New Zealand radio. Uh, it's again a, a subject of great fascination. The feet have been severed. No, they haven't. They have disarticulated quite naturally, as we've been able to show. And uh, you put a running shoe on that, and uh, naturally it will float, as you see with the disarticulated foot. It is something we could test experimentally at some point as well. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge many, many different groups, in particular, particularly uh, Venus, of course, and Ocean Networks Canada. And that's the end. <laughs>